much setting up all the wires. Wow, this is a relic. And Hugh, do you know the um, Alice G, the cultivating tractor, made 1948 to 1954? right after the war. Farmers really love it because it's... You see has, everything. You can see everything. This is a tough built that is kind of a knockoff. Knock yeah. Same, same idea. Yep, and uh, these guys have been converting it to electric. It makes a really uh, pretty simple electric conversion here wow. for the most part, I think. It's lightweight. Look at that. I'm gonna go get the motor real quick. I, I had to take off the motor to move it. So that's the motor. Wow. And it adapts. It goes in the... Right here. And it just pops on. And Richard, who's quite skilled, took off. It was a hydrostatic transmission. And uh... Um, so that's right between your feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We're gonna put a cover and fabricate a cover to keep the dirt and right. anything from touching the terminals. Well, I want a no-till planters that can do no-till planting in my market garden. We got one right out here. You ever hear of the Morrison? No. Let's well, go no, look it's at a it. Cedar. I'm sorry. It's a cedar. It's not a planter. Well, cedar planter. They it's plant seeds. Good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll show well, you. Well, yeah. It really works good. He unfortunately died right after we found him. Um, and so somebody, a guy who's doing, not tough built, but what's the name of the other one? The other knockoff of this? I don't remember here? the other knockoff. He, he heard about it from me and he bought the rights to it, but I don't know if he's producing it, but I'll show you. Those little Al Alice Chalmers yeah. were a good tractor. Yeah, yeah here's another yeah, one. Yeah, that's another. Original with the belly mower. So here what we want to use, this one is to do mow and blow. Okay. And I know you're a fan of the mow and blow, right? Yeah, me too. Uh, uh, Jim Fulmer out in Oregon yep. was, he, he was, uh, he had a good video on his mow and blow operation. Yeah, he came okay. and toured the farm here with, with Scout from Riverdale. It was fun because we toured the whole farm and I sat down and he gave a presentation on biodynamic. I said, we're pretty much there. He said, I could have told you that, Pat. Because <laughs> <laughs> we want to integrate animals. We want to get everything we can to the farm. So, no-till planters, that's what I want. Yeah, we should have showed you the transplanter over there. We, I, I was looking at a transplanter on the uh, first place we went. Yeah, yeah. That's a no-till transplanter. Pretty cool piece of equipment, but this is scale size. This is pretty this nice is for, the garden, for the small the farmer. Oh, okay, you disc openers, wow. It works well, it, it works really well. It's not a double disc, it's just no, got it's a just coulter. Like, yeah. Just got a coulter. Yeah, but it does a great but you, could, you could double disc it, you could well, the disc openers. This thing works really well. It also works great as a great stri strip tiller. What's the total weight on this? It might be 200 pounds or something. Well, that is not even that heavy. I mean, no, it's not heavy. Yeah. It's this probably is, only 100 pounds. Maybe. And the idea is we have another one that has to be counterweighted to the point where it's almost hard to manage. But this one, because you can stand on the back, you don't need that counterweight. You know? um, this, uh, this is my favorite so far. We haven't used it a bunch, but whenever we used it, it did a really good job. And yeah. I'm saying I want to try it a bunch more this year. I want to compare the both of them. Yeah. I had a coal no-tills, no-till planters mm -hmm. for planting corn, mm -hmm. mostly corn. It could plant anything. Mm -hmm. And what a beautiful job it did. I mean, you, you could adjust the depth and the way the press wheel went over it. I didn't have mice eating my seed. I didn't have crows pulling it out of the ground. It's just, it was precision. Well, the story on this guy was he had been the past president of the American Tillage Society, and he ended up being a no-till innovator, you know, which is a good journey for well, the Tillage Society. Guy. Yeah, well, I would think if you found out enough about tillage, then you'd, you'd want to know about no-till, because tillage is really destructive. He made this so it could be pulled by a horse. He was making this for the rest of the world, too. So this could be horse yeah, drawn. Really great. Are, are they still being fabricated, or did that quit when he passed on? Or I think we can get them fabricated again. I bet we can even just buy the rights back from that guy. I don't think he, he just he jumped on it. He saw it here, and he just saw it, and he jumped. I said that the guy had died, and, and so he reached out to the people and he bought the rights. But you know, he he really just wants to sell rights. I think, anyways. You know, so we might have to give him a little bit of money for each one we make. But I think we should make these. 
I yeah, think. yeah. I like the idea of ganging them together. I think ganging them is great, yeah. Because then we could hook it yeah. to a three-point hitch. <clears throat> but meanwhile, if you don't, if you only got a walk behind, yeah, you can put this behind a BCS. You can put this behind a gravelly. You know. You could turn this sideways and gang, gang more it. of them together. Yeah. Well, the thing is. You can't do that with a walk behind. It can't. It can't handle. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you put it on a three-port three hitch, yes, you, totally. you mount these on the toolbar. Totally. totally. Yep. Then, uh, yep. then, mm -hmm. this is your limitation. Your width. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can totally change. Uh, that. And and if you turn that sideways, mm -hmm. well, then you'd be in business. Mm -hmm. You need to. <clears throat> you need to be able to plant at least three rows down your beds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Well, the problem because with you, with this, you can't really do this and then plant a row next to it because you're driving over, you know, with your walk behind. So it's got to be you got to set it up so you're doing them all at once. I agree. Or you just don't do beds. You're just out in the field, you know, which is how we did it. You know, we used it for corn. We used it for beans, um, and both of those got established really well. You know? um, we had really good stands of it, and then we used it. We we turned around our sweet potato system at the moment. We, before that, it was all by hand. Just ripping the strips open with this, we've got the sweet potatoes. This in. is what you use there for the uh, well, we rows used, that you planted your squash and no, sweet potatoes in? No, we use the no-till transplanter over there, the bigger one, oh, okay. three-point hitch one. You yeah. could have used this to rip, we did do it. We ripped the strips and then the sweet potatoes, what used to take three days to plant, like 5,000 sweet potatoes, we put it in a day, half a day. Yeah. Know? Because but, all the work is working the soil, you know? Yeah. How long does it take to stick a plant in and firm it up, you know? So I, I like it as much for, for small scale. If you only have a walk behind, this is the tool. But I agree that for a bigger scale, you want to be able to do more. Well, we need to be thinking along those lines because one of the things I wanted to show you is what a difference it made when I started planting in beds with a meter wide spader. Yep. Not a, not one of these things that goes around, but one that does this. Because then my soil drained. Sure. Yeah, I have the other kind, which I got because my soil was too rocky, way too rocky for the other for the the the, 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 the other ones. Mine was pretty rocky too, and I got the Falk variety because it was real heavy duty. And the Chelly and the Gramegna. They're the ones I knew about. The Chelly yeah. is the one I've used, yeah. Yeah, the Chelly was uh, about, it was pretty lightweight compared to, it wasn't going to handle rocks very well. Yeah, this was the Etrusa. It's a, it's a Dutch one. It's built like a beast. It can handle the rocks. Yeah, but it, but it rotates instead of digging. You know how I learned what it did? Because I got told by the salesman that it did a glancing blow and didn't compact. Yeah, then we had a flood. flood crop, yeah. We had a flood and I had just spaded a bed. When I came and back, you, you know what I saw? You saw a ditch. <laughs> I saw a ditch and Nicely I saw the, I saw the, the marks where those yep. spades had hit. You know? Sure. Yeah, right. You know? It was like, sure. okay, well, that was a good story. <clears throat> I mean, it's, better than, it's still better than tilling. I had the, the salesman at an acres convention tell me how it, that was is just as good as the Italian, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. And it, it was obvious to me that it wasn't, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean... I guess it's I, a great improvement over a tiller, but it's not. It's not it's as still, good. As a it's still not as good as a spader. Yeah, that spader goes. Mm -hmm. Kick. Yeah. It shatters the soil, mm -hmm. and if I'm pushing a tomato steak in, I can push it in mm -hmm. to that shatter zone. Yeah. I can get that steak and just sit on it and push it right in, mm -hmm. and uh, oh. It goes way past the, you know, the little bit of spading that it does. It would be down there like that. Because it's shattering. Because yeah, it shattered yeah, it. Yeah, kind of like a key line plow, but obviously different. Doesn't doesn't have to actually penetrate that far to get that kind of opening up of the subsoil. Yeah, yeah, well, when it's dry and depending on the soil. That actually was a testimony <laughs> when, it, when I was taking the soil test. Our greenhouses in the garden over there where we just were, I took those soil tests, man. I could plunge that that thing in. I could plunge it to the handle with no effort at yeah. all. Yeah. Because we haven't tilled for years, and we've done cover crops all the time, yeah. and it's just open. The, well, then it drains when it rains, and you just, well, it's all of the things that you want. draining into us, so it keeps draining. Oh, well, <laughs> it is the We end. are in a bowl there, you know. So yeah. It's very important we have it, or we couldn't garden there at all. 
you know. But it's pretty impressive, and that to me is a testimony to cover crops and not till them, you know. And what's more, when you're cutting beds into your soil food web, mm -hmm. then the soil food web's still intact. Mm -hmm. And it's going to, from both sides of the bed, right it's in. going to move right back in again. You're going to get mycorrhiza on your corn. That's why I had Jeff it's present like, this, this spring on Savvy Tillage, Chef Poppin. Because yeah. Jeff tills, but he tills smart, you know? And he does it so that the mycorrhizae can come, you know, he'll just till it, he'll just do certain strips and not go back and forth every which way. They're the same way, you know? And he's tilling in his <coughs> biodynamic compost when he does it, you know? Um, That's another thing that I found that I had a huge misconception on when I started farming. I thought you had to mix your compost and your other inputs into the soil. Mm -hmm. And then this guy from Belgium, who came over here and established a homeopathic company, but he was a market gardener in Bel Belgium, mm -hmm. Luke Charlton. And I'm out there on his place, uh, past Conyers in east of Atlanta, red clay soil, I mean heavy red clay. And his carrots, his daikons, his cabbages, broccolis, all the rest of these were doing better than I grew and I'd been growing for years and years and years, 15 years. Mm -hmm. And he was doing better in the second year than I was. Mm -hmm. And he was spreading compost on that particular occasion. And he had his wheelbarrow and he was scattering a little compost around on the surface. And I asked him, how are you going to mix that into the soil? And he said, oh, no. He says, you never mix compost into the soil. He says you put it on the top and let the soil's animal life mix it in. Yeah, that's what we're true. That's what we're the only <laughs> problem with that is oxidation from sun and. So that's why I want. That's why cover crops on top of that or mulch work even better. To me, the strategy should be: we put it in after our fall cover crop has been rolled, and we put down a fast-growing summer cover crop. And when it's about that tall. And it's still pretty early, that's when we put the compost down. And then mm -hmm. it's shaded by that cover crop. Mm -hmm. you know? Last time we did it, the, oh, the, it the right winter, we put it right before we rolled, yeah. So we spread it, covering it yeah. and then yeah. rolled it right on top of the compost. Yeah, I want something on top of it. I don't want it yeah. sitting there in the sun baking, you know. But it doesn't have to be soil at all. You know, it can be biomass. Well, I put compost down on a bed and tilled it in and planted it in ginger. <clears throat> first time I'd ever tried to grow ginger, and I grow ginger roots almost as big as my thumb, mm -hmm. which isn't too impressive, really. So the next year, I put twice as much compost down and tilled it in, and grew ginger roots as big as my little finger. <laughs> <laughs> You didn't do it and twice that's, as big the next that, year, did it? No, twice as much compost. No, no, no. I got, I got the idea, you know. You don't want to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. <clears throat> so I went back in my back field to the poorest part of my land, tilled that up in beds, didn't put any compost down, planted my ginger in the beds, and mulched them with oak bark from the sawmill. And man, I got ginger clumps like this, ginger like ginger roots like this, you know. Man, I had ginger. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I thought, well, that worked pretty good. So the next year, I took absolutely new land. It had never been growing anything, but just I had to build a road to get there. And after something like 60 tons of rocks through a swamp and a culvert and so various things, then I got over there and I tilled that one up in beds and did the same thing, planted it with just oak bark mulch, and it bloomed. <laughs> and yeah, and it made the best ginger. Boy, it was great ginger. Uh -huh. uh, a friend of mine who is a Japanese chef he visited, and I said, here, let me give you some ginger. We filled the trunk of his car up with ginger, 
you know it's like here <laughs> it's just this is I've more than I can sell <laughs> Amazing. yeah it really it really did grow it it's so we've got shade we've got shade to get in the greenhouse for a minute yeah we can yep 